uh, Merdad. Sorry about that. You can hear no me. No problem. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Clay. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Um, here is the title of the talk. I guess you're familiar with it. I'm not going to talk much more about it. Let me introduce myself, first of all, um, as soon as I get my mouse set up here. Uh, so, you know, who's talking here? Um, I, my name is Mirdad Sultanzade. Uh, I have about uh, more than uh, two decades of experience. Uh, in the area of geomechanics. I have degrees in geological, geotechnical, and civil engineering. Uh, I've been practicing geomechanics in both academia uh, and industry. Um, and among my research and work, there have been a few CapRock integrity assessment projects for, cap, uh, for carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, or as we call it, CCUS projects. Um, I have taught geomechanics uh, at multiple universities, at different professional associations, and different companies since. And since 2013, I've been uh, the instructor of a number of geomechanics courses at Petro Skills. I currently work as a director and geomechanics expert at Petro Gym Inc. Uh, it's a company that provides consulting, training, and R&D services in different areas of geomechanics and geotechnical engineering. Uh, I'll go quickly through objectives of uh, this presentation. It's more like a kind of educational presentation. Uh, in a nutshell, the objective of this webinar is to familiarize the audience with the concept and process of CapRock integrity assessment for CCUS projects. If I want to go in a bit of more details, at the end of this presentation, I hope the audience will be able to recognize the results and risks associated with CCUS, be able to describe uh, at least at kind of preliminary uh, level the mechanical response of the rocks to CO2 injection, and uh, ultimately be able to explain uh, the generic workflows that are being used for CapRock integrity assessment. Um, starting uh, with a little bit of introducing CCUS, um, as which I which I mentioned it stands for geological sequestration, as you're talking about ca uh, carbon capture, uh, utilization, and sequestration. And it seems to be one of the globally accepted solutions for the problem of CO2 emissions all around the world. Is that the only solution? Definitely, people are looking at several other solutions, but this seems to be working. And uh, as as and and, and that that's. Kind of we have we have the best witness of us as this map showing that there are several CCUS projects being considered on the world that you see there are a few uh, in the United States in the Europe we have some here in Canada um, and uh, apparently there are so many proposals out there people are talking about uh, <coughs> starting new projects new sequestration projects hopefully to be able to uh, address to address the problem of uh, net zero or carbon capture and sequestration with a kind of efficient way. Uh, if if you are kind of new to this field, basically CCUS has uh, some kind of uh, uh, components that have been identified in this graphics. The process of CCUS starts with capturing the CO2 from a concentrated emission source such as a power plant, a cement factory, or refinery, where the CO2 is captured through some physiochemical processes and it's compressed to be transferred to the sequestration sites. Um, while you see a truck transferring, it, transferring the CO2 here, that's not the case in industrial cases. I've seen trucks transferring CO2 to some sites, but mostly uh, not for the industrial cases, they are for pilot cases. Um, so. It's mostly a pipeline taking CO2, and then the CO2 will be injected underground. Either just simply for a storage purposes, so usually there are different kind of formations we consider. Uh, good, for instance, uh, saline aquifers for uh, storing CO2, or uh, in, some, in many cases these days, 
and it used to be used uh, like for decades actually, but it's becoming more uh, a topic of sequestration as well, in addition to EOR. Uh, the CO2 is injected to help with the oil recovery, which we call the CO2 EOR, and the term utilization actually comes from there. If you're interested in uh, what's the cost of each step, uh, there are some notions of the cost in a slide, and on this slide that you can see uh, in here. Uh, while, while we have talked about using CO2 for EOR, in CCUS, let's not forget that the main idea is uh, holding CO2 underground almost forever. Um, if, like me, you're interested in ancient uh, mythology, the concept of CO2 sequestration may remind you of the myth of Hades, who is the ancient Greek god of the underworld. And also his tree-headed dog, which was called Cerebrus. Uh, their jobs was mainly watching the gates of underworld uh, to make sure that no soul can escape from that dark place. Uh, <coughs> and it seems that uh, in, in the case of CO2 sequestration, we are encountering a similar situation. Um, now, let's see who is supposed to watch the injected CO2 and prevent it from leaving its perpetual resting place underground. It seems a four-headed trapping uh, mechanism uh, is involved in withholding carbon dioxide underground. The initial trapping mechanism is structural and strat stratigraphic trapping as shown here. The low permeability sealing system, which is we usually call the cap rock, is expected to hold the high pressure CO2 uh, and make sure it won't escape. At the same time, some of the carbon dioxide is expected to be trapped in the pores without being able to move. We call this residual uh, pore trapping. And some of it will be dissolved in the reservoir fluid, like in the water or in the residual oil that we have in the field. These two trapping mechanisms, these two latter mechanisms, are expected to play a more important role as the CO2 plume expands further in time within the geological storage unit. It goes further and further, and these two mechanisms get more involved, and their role becomes more significant. And after a very long time, we expect some of the injected CO2 uh, to be uh, turned or converted into solid through some kind of geochemical reactions with the host rocks. So that's our hope for future. But it seems that at the initial stage, we rely the most on the structural and stratigraphic trapping, or as I said, in other terms, we call it caprock integrity. So obviously, the caprock plays the most important role in keeping CO2 underground. And any compromise in its integrity can result in CO2 leakage, as you can see it here. Leakage of CO2 can occur in different ways. It can go through the fractures, it can go through the falls. Uh, one of the main concerns that we have are the wells, mostly the abandoned wells that we're not sure about their integrity. That, those may also act as kind of conduits for a pathways for the leakage of the CO2. Um, so, I'll talk so far about leakage of CO2 and seems to be among the most important hazards that is associated with CCUS. This hazard can lead to different environmental, health and safety, economic and socio-political risks, as you're seeing in here. But, of course, other than leakage, there may be other risks and hazards. Storage of CO2 can lead to ground deformation and heave. If it's too much, it can affect the surface, surface structures. Uh, if it's too much, it can also affect the, well that, the wells in the uh, uh, field and damage them, which can, this can lead to kind of some economic problems. Also, it can lead to leakage of CO2. One of the main concerns that we have with injection in general, it's been happening all over the world, 
uh, for, for, for injection of waste fluid, for instance, or other types of fluid as induced seismicity, which comes through fault reactivation. Many people believe that fault reactivation itself can uh, make, make the dormant ceiling faults uh, turned uh, in, in kind of pass in, into some pathways for leakage of the carbon dioxide. Also, there are some other risks like injectivity performance uh, that we need to conserve uh, co to be concerned. Uh, probably in terms mostly to, uh, in, in the in the sense of economic, how it's going to affect our CO2 injection in future. Uh, most of the hazards that you see in this list. Are studied, are studied under the umbrella of Caprock Integrity Assessment. So we use this kind of generic term, Caprock Integrity Assessment, and whenever we're doing this process, we try to evaluate these different hazards and at the same time, uh, make sure that the risks that are, they are imposing to a project are not significant. So, Let's take a look at this, this issue of Caprock integrity and I'll talk a little bit about the role of geomechanics. Um, one of the initial factors that we study in Caprock integrity uh, is to ensure that the injected CO2 simply cannot leak through the intact Caprock as a result of capillary leakage. So simply fluid comes that from, from the reservoir or from the, the storage unit uh, flows through the cap rock comes out. And it's, it's not hard to do that. There are tests that we can uh, do on the rock samples, making sure that uh, its conditions are favorable for uh, uh, making sure that this leakage or fluid is not happening. Another one is, uh, which can threaten the cap rock integrity is uh, that the sealing characteristics of the cap rock are somehow uh, being deteriorated by physical, by physiochemical processes. For instance, by the solution of the carbonates, uh, we may create some pathways in the caprock. That's another concern that we need to address. This is happening mostly through geochemical studies. Another important possibility for losing integrity is through geomechanical changes, which can result in damaging the wells. Uh, initiating new fractures or opening the existing fractures, and as I mentioned, fault reactivation. So, in this presentation, I'm trying to focus more on this geomechanical mechanisms, especially fracturing and fault reactivation. Um, to explain um, how a geomechanical problem is solved, I usually use this simple definition. Um, according to this definition, geomechanics studies the mechanical response of the rock to the events that disturb their initial state. This means that in any geomechanical problem that you want to solve, one of them being this uh, problem of uh, CCC, CCUS, cap rock integrity, there is an initial state that is being disturbed and leads to some mechanical responses. In fact, our main task in geomechanics is to find this mechanical response. To do that, we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of this initial state and how this disturbing event works. Now, I'm going to use this definition to explain the problem of cap rock integrity. Now, let's talk about the disturbing event. There are different mechanisms that can disturb the initial mechanical state of rocks, which have been listed here. So you have deformation. For instance, if you have tectonic forces, they're leading to deformation in the rock and they, create, they can disturb uh, the rock and lead to some kind of mechanical responses. When you're drilling, in fact, you're changing the geometry of the rock. In the case of CCUS, the main disturbance mechanisms are changes in pore pressure, and temperature. The injected CO2 in the rock usually is a kind of supercritical condition, and therefore it is injected with a high pressure and also low temperature. So these two effects are expected to lead some kind of lead to some mechanical responses in the rock, which I'm going to talk about them here. 
let's see, what should be, for instance, that's an example, basically. I'm going to talk about temperature later. Let's see what we should expect when put pressure in a reservoir or a storage unit is increasing. In a similar way that you can inflate a balloon while holding it in your hand, we you expect the reservoir to start expanding. When it's expanding, it's going to push the surrounding rock, for instance, overburden, side burden, or underburden of the uh, reservoir storage unit. And even as a result of this pushing and deforming, it can result to some uh, heave at the surface and ground deformation uh, in locations which are really far from the reservoir itself. But let's remember that the deformation of the storage unit is somehow constrained by its surrounding rock. So it's not, it's not like it can deform freely as much as it wants as a result of pressure increase. And this, as a result, this, the surrounding rock is trying to keep this storage unit, which is trying to expand in place. That's going to be interaction between these two. We're going to have some forces trying to push outward from the storage unit. We're going to have some forces acting exactly in an opposite way, trying to keep the storage unit in place and avoid it from deformation. As a result of these deformations and this uh, balance between these forces, we should expect some changes to happen in the stresses almost everywhere both within that storage unit and also outside it. And the side burden, as I said, under burden and over burden. So that's going to be basically one of the mechanical responses or two of the mechanical responses that we expect to pressure increase, deformation and also changes in the stresses. For instance, the stress change path under the schematic graph that you see in here is showing us how the initial horizontal and vertical stresses are changing as a result of change in pore pressure. And if these stress changes are high enough, that will be too much for the, for the rock to take. And then as a result, when it comes to that threshold or failure criterion of the rock, we expect rock to fail and shear or intention. In this case, you see a kind of simple Coulomb failure criterion for shear, where it can happen in tension as well. So the rock failure in here is governed by failure criteria, which we need to find them. And they are different for different types of rock. And if the rock fails, we're going to start seeing some fractures uh, inside the reservoir. In other cases, for the case of fault reactivation, so if you already have a dormant fault in here, and then the stress is changing off, there might be a chance for that fault to be reactivated. So that's the general concept behind uh, the, the mechanical response of the rock to CO2 uh, sequestration and injection. Now you see that in addition, the deformation and stress change, we may have the chance of failure. In the next case, let's take a look at the temperature decrease. That's supposed to be temperature decrease, basically. And um, in this case, uh, the storage unit is being cooled down as a result of injecting to, uh, low temperature CO2. So, Therefore, you expect to have some contraction inside the reservoir. So the reservoir starts contracting. In a very similar fashion to the case of injection and expansion, you expect to see some deformation in the rock within the storage unit and outside it. And also you expect to see some kind of changes or deformation at the ground surface even. But also, the surrounding rock is trying to keep this deforming storage unit in place, and as a result, we should expect to see changes in stresses almost everywhere, in the overburden, side burden again, and also within the reservoir. So if I want to do the same thing for the case of temperature decrease, I'll see that 
In this case as well, uh, we expect the stresses to change in a fashion that can lead to failure. And as a result of failure, either we're initiating a new fracture or we're going to have uh, a fault reactivated, for instance. Now, let's, let's put everything together in here. Uh, we saw the effect of temperature, we saw the effect of pore pressure, we saw how they, they can lead to changes in the stresses, and as a result, uh, lead to failure in the rock. Based on uh, the explained mechanisms that I mentioned in here, we probably have some questions to ask. One of the first question is, what is the initial stress state? initially what kind of stresses we have there. The second question is, how these stresses are going to change? The third question is, what is the failure criterion? And the first question is, is the rock at that specific place that we are interested in, for instance, the calf rock is going to fail or not? So while answering these questions, we'll get some more information. We also know how much is the deformation of the rock. And is that deformation enough uh, to kind of compromise the reliability of the project? It can lead to uh, problems in the wells, damage them, or it can lead to big changes at the surface and create uh, some issues uh, for the structures at the surface, like pipelines, for instance. Now, the main intention of uh, me and the stock is trying to do and answer some of these questions. So the first thing that we need to address is finding initial stress state. What is the vertical stress? What is minimum horizontal stress, maximum horizontal stress, and what is the horizontal stress orientation? These, these, these four different stress components, uh, they're not always kind of the best representative of stress state in the rock, but in many cases, we can assume that they work fine for us. Uh, and one of the main tasks that we do in almost every geomechanical problem is trying to find these uh, different parameters. For vertical stress, uh, we can use uh, cap rock integrity, uh, so we can use density logs, we do some integration on them to find them. For minimum horizontal stress, they can be measured or estimated by field tests like mini frag tests. We use some other ways like pluralistic modeling to extend the results of mini frag tests. Uh, from a point to a uh, thickness of a reservoir, for instance, or even further to the complete thickness of the rock. Uh, maximum horizontal stress, or SH max, is extremely hard to measure. Uh, there are some ways, uh, basically I cannot measure it, I would say it that way, but there are some ways that we can estimate some range of variation for it, mainly, mainly from the drilling experience by reverse analysis. Horizontal stress orientation, on the other hand, is not too difficult to find because there are several different ways or indicators that can help us uh, to find out. Probably one of the best is the drilling induced indicators that we see on image logs. So that's pretty much a very kind of a short review of how we can find uh, stresses. Uh, now let's talk about the failure criteria. So failure criteria means that if the rock is expecting to fail or not fail uh, under uh, specific uh, arrangements of loads, stresses, and deformations. Failure criteria are usually found by testing the rock in the laboratory. They can be as simple as the Coulomb failure criterion that you see in here, as a simple line, or they can be complex 3D uh, failure criteria that we need to do some kind of more complex tests, complex, te complex tests in the laboratory, like poly polyaxial tests, and instead of this tri simple, simpler triaxial test that we do for the Coulomb failure criterion. Now, let's see how this stress change path is found. As I mentioned, in the case of CO2 injection, the main drivers behind changes in the initial stress state or variations in pore pressure and temperature. These variations are usually calculated by reservoir simulation. 
which I'm going to show you some examples later. Uh, and these reservoir simulators are using the rules of fluid flow and heat transfer to tell us how the pressure and how the temperature of the storage unit is changing when CO2 is injected. This is an example from a case that I'm going to talk later about. Uh, but um, just I want you from here to see that the patterns of change in pore pressure are very different from the patterns of change in the temperature. Now, imagine we know how pore pressure and temperature will vary, and we want to find how they relate to changes in in situ stresses. I want you to remember how, how I introduced this concept of a stress change. I told you that this reservoir wants to expand, and uh, because of the constraints of the surrounding rock, it cannot expand as much as it wants, it cannot deform as much as it likes, and then the stresses are going to change. So it seems that something is there about the deformation of the rock. How, basically the question is, how for pressure and temperature changes are going to deform the rock and make it expand. This is something related to a concept called constitutive behavior, which is basically uh, studies, uh, which basically studies how rocks deform when the stress, pressure, and temperature change. So it seems that one thing that we are uh, kind of we need to know to find how stresses are changing is the constitutive behavior model of the rock. And usually we have to find that out using uh, the laboratory test. That's the best way. In many cases, we can compromise and use some kind of logs or seismic data to come up with some estimations of this behavior. Now, Having that information, how pore pressure, how, 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 what's the constitutive model, how pore pressure and temperature are changing, we are able to take those information in a geomechanical model and find out that the stress path, how stresses are changing, how vertical and horizontal stresses are changing. These models that I'm talking about um, come in different forms. Uh, the, in, in a very kind of uh, high-level uh, classification, I can have three groups. Analytical models, which are closed form equations with simplified assumptions about the reservoir geometry. For instance, in here you see it's kind of a spherical geometry and the rock materials. And also about the pore pressure and temperature change. For instance, many of them are assuming that pore pressure and temperature change is uniform. Another option is semi-analytical models, which allow more complex geometries for the reservoir or non-uniform pressure or temperature change. Uh, the more complex one is numerical models, which can consider all different types of complexities related to geometry, rock properties, and pore pressure. One of the questions that we usually ask, which one we want to use? Um, if you feel that geomechanical models are very complex, you may want to see this closed form solution that can be used to calculate the changes in horizontal and vertical stresses almost everywhere, within the reservoir, in the cap rock, in other places. Um, basically, what you see in here that stress changes are functions of Poisson's ratio of the rock, I guess many of you are familiar, it comes from a linear elastic uh, constitutive model for the rock, pore pressure change, and interestingly, interestingly, I want you to pay attention more to this parameter, aspect ratio of the reservoir. So it seems that the geometry of the reservoir, or this disturbed area, basically, where the pressure or temperature is changing, in this case, pressure, plays an important role. Uh, now, I want you to imagine a very long reservoir with a limited thickness. So, which means the thickness versus, or compared to the length of the reservoir, or width of the reservoir is very small, which means that the small aspect ratio. So, E is 
very small flows to zero. And look what happens to those equations. I want you to focus on this Caprock uh, stress changes. So you see that the changes in the Caprock are going to be very, very small, close to zero. That seems to be good news because if the stress changes in the Caprock are small, then we don't expect the initial state to change significantly, and then we shouldn't expect half failure. Um, and we know that many of our reservoirs, they have this limited thickness and pressure change is significant through the reservoir. And goes laterally, uh, like sometimes for, for, for thousands of meters or for uh, hundreds of meters. So we may be able to make that assumption. But when it gets to the temperature, that's going to be a different story. I'm going to talk about that later in one of our case studies. Now, it seems that we are at the stage that we can put all these different pieces we talked about together and create a workflow for modeling, as it's shown in here. According to this workflow, pressure and temperature uh, changes are expected to be found. As I mentioned, it happens through fluid flow and heat transfer modeling. Usually, we call it reservoir simulation. And then, these parameters are used in a geomechanical model, one of those models that I showed you a simple example, to find out how much is the stress change and how much is the deformation. Then we have this, these design and failure criteria, which will be used to tell us if these deformation or stress changes are leading to any hazards, for instance, fault reactivation or initiation of fracture. Uh, usually, we call this part of the workflow reservoir simulation, and the whole part in here, geomechanical modeling. We have a reservoir simulator feeding data and information to the geomechanical model. This is called one-way modeling. I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I get to the case studies, which is the time right now. Uh, now, through the, the general information that provided here, I want to see uh, how we can apply this this, this uh, workflow for the assessment of Caprock integrity uh, for CCUS projects. And I'm going to go through some case studies in here. My first case study in here is uh, the Zama acid gas injection project, which is located in the northwest of Alberta province in Canada. That's where I'm living. Uh, this oil field has an interesting geology. As the oil is deposited in about 800 Pinnacle reef is carbonated structures, which are separated from each other. So they are not connected, basically. Prior to starting acid gas injection, which includes 70% of CO2 and 30% of H2S, they used to release the CO2 in the air and uh, capture H2S and transfer or convert it to sulfur, sulfur blocks which was basically, at that time, I remember, was no market for them. And also, they were taking so much space. But in 2006, they started injecting CO2 within this pinnacle reef for both EOR and storage purposes. The objective of the geomechanical study, which I'm going to uh, present here, or briefly mention here, was finding the potential for fault reactivation during isothermal production injection in these reservoirs. And when I'm saying isothermal means that the effect of temperature was not considered. So the stress change model that uh, was used here was a little bit more complex than what I showed you before. It still is a closed form solution, uh, but it has this limitation that it has to be run for a spirit shape reservoir. One thing that we did, we compared the result of the straight shape reservoir with the actual geometry of the reservoir using a numerical model and found that the answers are pretty similar or consistent. So that means that we are able to use this model to find out how stresses are changing within the reservoir, also everywhere in the side burdens, cap rock, and under burden. The idea here wasn't finding stress changes. We use a kind of reverse uh, way uh, 
and then use those equations to find out what's the critical pressure change that can lead to fault reactivation. So these equations that you're seeing in here were kind of enabled us to find out how much is this pressure change that can lead to reactivation in both cases, because there was a kind of CO2 EOR or acid gas injection and production case, uh, we had to consider the effect of production and injection altogether. Now, the question was how we can find the rock properties. We went to all the public uh, materials and tried to find uh, every test or every parameter from the logs that could help us to find out, for instance, what is Poisson's ratio. That was an important parameter you saw there. Uh, what's the elastic parameters in here, like Young's modulus of the reservoir, Young's modulus of the cap rock that you're seeing. And also, what's the friction angle for the rock? What's the friction angle for the faults? And we came with some numbers, but it was a limited number of uh, parameter, uh, values that we could find through our search. That's why we decided to go uh, with probabilistic analysis to address the uncertainty that we were seeing in data. So basically, uh, we went with a normal distribution. What was the minimum value? What's the maximum value? Average and standard deviation and data analysis. This is the result of analysis, which is telling us, for instance, that in the case of injection, uh, if we inject with a pressure change or pressure increase less than 11 MPA, seems to be that we are safe with a 90% of the confidence. Also, we can see, based on this analysis, what parameters are important in this case is the minimum stress and fault friction angle. So we can put more time on investigation and doing tests and analysis to find these values. Uh, if you're curious that where, in this case, was the most a uh, favorable place for fault reactivation or analysis uh, confirmed that it's the side burdens. So for the side burdens, in the case of injection, you need 12.6 MPA with 90 percentile uh, confidence to create a reactivation. In the case of injection, it was 6.6. In the case of production, it was 6.3 pressure decrease. Another example that I want to show you is from the Heartland area, Red Butter, uh, in, also in Alberta, it's in central north Alberta almost. The idea here was bringing CO2 uh, from this industrial area, the gray area I see here, and inject it in this huge reef, which is in a close by, very close almost, uh, and it kind of overlaps in some areas. This reef, as Red Water Reef, it's kind of one of probably the largest oil field in Alberta. But the idea here wasn't injecting CO2 for the purpose of EOR or in this depleted uh, area. It was injecting CO2 down here in this dolomitized high porosity uh, uh, location, which shows uh, which has kind of high injectivity and high capacity. Uh, in this case, there were several groups working on uh, geophysical characterization and also uh, geological characterization came up with a very fine model of uh, different layers that you're seeing in here. And we turned that in a geomechanical characterization model, or some people may call it mechanical or earth model, uh, which identifies the reservoir, different cap rocks that you see in here, and different layers. We use different types of rock properties from logs and laboratory, wherever possible, to come up uh, with characterization of different, different parameters, for instance. Uh, in this case, you see how Young's modulus varies through this model in the entire field. Now, that was the time of modeling. So the idea for modeling was using this one-day model, doing fluid flow and heat transfer simulation. In this case, temperature was ignored as well only pressure effect was considered, and then doing geomechanical modeling, find the stresses, deformations, and find out if, if there is any risk for this specific uh, CCS, CCS project. 
So here is the result of fluid flow modeling. It shows how the plume of CO2 is moving through the reservoir by time, the storage unit basically. And then also it shows how the pore pressure is changing. Um, as you see in here, um, the changes are kind of uh, becoming more uniform throughout the reservoir as time goes by. So having this change in pore pressure, the question is, how we're going to have changes in stresses induced. Now, these are the results of changes in two of the stresses, SH main and vertical stress, after 20 years of injection. What you see in here shows that most of the changes are happening within the reservoir and also, to some extent, in the flanks of the reservoir in the side burdens. We see less stress changes in the cap rock, and that kind of uh, matches with that simple model that I showed you, which was telling you if you have a low aspect ratio, the changes in stresses in the cap rock are small. Then we use these stress changes in a failure criteria, in different failure criteria, to find out what's the chance of fault reactivation, or what's, what's the chance of initiating new shear fractures or tensile fractures. And we came up with some good numbers, basically. Uh, if this number that you see in here, faulty activation ratio, is one or higher, there is a chance of failure. Same for this number, which is rock failure ratio. But as you see in here, it's more or less, very close to 0 0.5 or less. So there is less chance for failure as a result of pressure change. So that's, that's the kind of simple way of doing this analysis using 3D models. Also, we were able to find how much is the ground deformation, both within the reservoir and also at the surface, at the ground surface. So as you see in here, the deformation is about 1.6 centimeter, which seems to be uh, in a very good range, probably not imposing so much risk. Probably we should test that to see if that can result in any kind of well damage. Now, this is another project that kind of was commenced last, week, last year. Uh, like people are excited in Alberta about it. It's a CO2E or a storage project, uh, which is called Clive. Basically, the idea is bringing uh, CO2 from the same industrial heartland area I showed you before in the other project. Uh, and they're bringing it uh, through a pipeline, which is about 240 kilometers and injecting it into uh, this, this reservoir, which is called Clive Reservoir, basically Clive Field, which includes two reservoirs that I'll show you in the next figure. Uh, what you see in here is the development plan for different phases for the next 10 years. Um, so this, this in this case, we have two separate reservoirs. Both are in carbonates, and both of them have shale cap rocks. And uh, for this case as well, we created a 3D model, coming up with an idea of how different parameters, uh, geomechanical parameters like a stresses, uh, failure parameters, and also constitutive behavior parameters are changing through this field, and did the analysis. Uh, and came up again, for this isothermal case, we ignored the effect of temperature and we came up with similar results. The same, what you see in here in this parameter uh, is called a strength a stress ratio. This time, if it is one or less, it means that we have some failure. If it's higher, there is a lower chance for failure. And as you see in here, it's about 2.5 or higher, which means that the chance for failure is minimal in this case. Again, in the case of deformation, we'll see that the deformation is in the kind of uh, range of millimeters, 2.5 millimeters or 7 millimeters, not extensive at all. Now, so far, I was talking about one-way coupling, uh, which was used in our models, meaning that the geomechanical response of the rock in terms of the stresses and the strains does not have any effect on the fluid flow and heat transfer simulation. You may question this assumption and tell me that 
because the stresses and the strains are affecting the porosity of the rock. They can also affect the permeability of the rock and lead to fluid flow and lead to changes in our model, fluid flow and heat transfer simulation model. That's why uh, in many cases, if we have time and we have money, we'd rather to go with two-way coupling, which means that the results of your mechanical model are going to be returned. Uh, and, and it's going to be, going to be uh, fed to the fluid flow and heat transfer simulation. Because, as I mentioned, the formation of the rock can influence the porosity and permeability. Uh, now, I want to use this opportunity as our last case study uh, to see how this two-way model is work, but that's not the only one. Previously, in all those three cases, I didn't talk about temperature. We assumed that the uh, pore pressure, we assumed that the pore pressure of the rock basically uh, is the only one that is changing, and there is no change in temperature. We call that isothermal cases. No, I want to talk about thermal cases or non-isothermal cases. This is an example uh, which was published. Uh, if you're interested, it's a speed paper. Uh, you can take a look at it. Uh, and the idea over there was uh, studying the effect of temperature. See how it influences the cap rock integrity. This is the reservoir. This is the cap rock. As you see, again, it's a thin reservoir, very long, and similar case for the cap rock. Where we did the analysis, fluid flow and heat transfer modeling, we came up with this plumes of pressure and temperature change. But in the reservoir, it seems that pressure change is very uniform. And it follows the shape of the reservoir or the storage unit. For that reason, considering that has a limit, it has a limited thickness comparing with its width, its aspect ratio, it's almost close to zero. So it means that similar to previous cases, we may not have so many challenges in the cap rock if the pressure change was the only parameter that is influencing the cap rock integrity. But let's take a look at how temperature changes. Temperature changes seems to be seem to be very local. Look at this scale, lateral distance. And the temperature change is happening more around the well bore. It seems that it's more through conduction than convection. One other thing I want you to notice here is the cap rock, that the temperature is also changing inside the cap rock. In the previous cases, because of the low permeability of the cap rock, in the isothermal case, there was of course, no temperature change in the cap rock. Also, there was no pressure change in the cap rock. In this case, because the temperature is changing in this undrained, low permeability condition of the cap rock, we are seeing that the pressure is also changing in the cap rock. One other thing I want you to note here is the shape of the plume of temperature is completely different. Now, we have an aspect ratio, which is even more than one. So that means that the stress change patterns are very different with the case of pore pressure change. Putting this all together, we probably going to expect some differences for the stress changes in the case of thermal and isothermal. And the results show that, yes, there are significant differences. On the left graph, you're, so, you're, you're seeing how the total stress changes are varying within the reservoir by the years of CO2 injection. What is apparent in here is after the thermal effects, so the solid line is showing you the isothermal solution, while the dotted or dashed lines are showing you the thermal solutions. Apparently, there is a big difference. 
So in some cases, the stress changes, even they change their signs. And that's going to affect the results of our caprock integrity assessment. That means that there is a chance for tensile fractures. Similarly, in the caprock, as I mentioned before, in many of the cases that we study because of that low aspect ratio of the storage unit or reservoir, we shouldn't expect so much stress change in the caprock if core pressure change is the only factor. But when we're applying the changes in temperature, you'll see big changes also in the caprock. As a result, it's likely that we're going to have uh, negative stress changes in the cap rock leading to tensile fractures in the cap rock, which is something that we don't like, definitely. These two graphs are showing the deformation patterns, both cases of thermal and isothermal. And as you see in here, for instance, in the cap rock, uh, the solid lines, which are for isothermal case, tell us that we shouldn't expect to have so much chain deformation uh, in this case, while in the case of temperature change or thermal, we expect to have a significant changes in the deformation or a strain, basically. So we're going to have rock deforming there. So all of this is telling us, considering the effect of temperature is important, unless you are sure. I, I was visiting a site in Germany. They were, they were trying to bring the CO2 to the temperature of the um, reservoir. It was a pilot case, of course, and injected there. And that could have been considered an isothermal case. But if you're using supercritical CO2 trying to inject it, it's important to consider the effect of temperature. Now, let's go back to that concept of one-way versus two-way. Uh, I want to also mention that. So we, in this case, we studied the difference between one-way and two-way modeling. And you can see this clear difference between how pressure change is affected in two-way versus one-way in both the cap rock and within the reservoir. How important it is depends on your, the accuracy that you're after. In many cases, you may compromise and decide to go with one-way modeling, which seems to be much simpler. But we should always keep in mind that there is an effect that we are ignoring there. And maybe we should somehow consider it or account for it in a different way. So that was pretty much the presentation. Uh, let's take a look at, back at the, uh, at the objectives. Uh, I started with recognizing the hazards and risk associated with CCUS. Uh, I tried to explain some of the geomechanical mechanisms like how, uh, we, how, how, how the deformations are leading to stress changes, the different parameters that are important uh, for us to identify for finding how these stress changes are happening and what's the likelihood of failure, for instance, or for deactivation. And then I used some case studies to explain the generic workflows that we use for cap rock integrity assessment with some emphasizing on the importance of temperature change. Um, so, I go, I go through these slides and know that we are, we are short on time. Uh, so if here, here are contact information, but I'm waiting for questions. If you have questions that you want to ask through email, please contact Clay or me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Merdad. Um, and I will send out the resources that were the slides that you skipped over in case people are interested in learning more. Um, so we do have quite a few questions here, uh, so I will start running through those uh, now and, and, and that will wrap up our session. Uh, the first question here says, how do you deal with an unstable initial state? For example, a depleted gas field that has undergone compaction and or fault reactivation and may not have reached equilibrium. That's, that's a very good question. Um, First of all, there were so many uh, kind of important notes that uh, we, we are missing in this presentation. Uh, they, need, they need another opportunity, and one of them is this one. Uh, so in cases that we have had a depleting reservoir, as it was mentioned in the question, there are chances that uh, somehow the ceiling and integrity uh, of that reservoir or that cap rock has been lost during the production. Uh, something 
this is very important to be studied. Uh, how to deal with it in geomechanics, we usually go and run our model through the production. I gave you an example in the case of Zama. We ran it also for production to see how much those changes uh, are, how important they are, and how they can compromise the ceiling characteristics. But uh, in addition to that, uh, one, of, one, of, one of probably the best ways is doing the monitoring. So baseline monitoring before starting CO2 injection, making sure that uh, the chances that, uh, I guess that there might be some kind of uh, evidence showing the leakage of hydrocarbon through those uh, reactivated faults, that's something to consider. But this is, this is a complex issue that needs to be taken uh, seriously and uh, more, more definitely more, more, crack trust, more, more ceiling characterization uh, need to be considered. Thanks for mentioning that. All right. Uh, next question here asks, uh, can you comment if there are trends for reservoir and caprock types regarding the pressure and temperature effects of injection? And then comments, I would assume over time that pressure is most important initially and then over time the temperature. Uh, in terms of time trends, I would say we expect the temperature to equilibrate, come to kind of equilibrium condition after a while with the reservoir. So we expect the effect of temperature, and maybe maybe I can go back in this slide and show you how it happens. So basically, during after after a while, the temperature comes into a kind of equilibrium with the environment around it, and then its effect will be minimized. The pressure, however, depends on uh, how far your CO2 plume can go. This is this is what I'm talking about. So what you see in here is uh, the case of uh, injecting CO2 and how the temperature plume is, or disturbance plume is varying by time. Uh, in this case, uh, the injection ceased after 50 years. And as you see in here, after 200 years, almost all those changes are disappearing. And that's because of the uh, conduction and convection effects that kind of trying to bring the temperature in equilibrium with the reservoir. Uh, so, probably in the case of temperature as well, in the case of poor pressure, we're saying that um, if you give it enough time, and in this case, the reservoir has, doesn't have any kind of lateral boundaries, it can go, uh, the, flu the fluid flow can happen through the time forever almost, and for that reason also the pressure change is, gonna, is going to dissipate by time, and after 200 years, you also see kind of minimal changes in pressure. So in both cases, it seems that's the case, yeah. All right, next question asks, are old oil field cap rocks generally too compromised to be viable for CO2 storage? That's a very hard question. Honestly, I personally, uh, as being a conservative person in, in terms of risk analysis, I, I would I would go uh, with the most caution. Want to make sure um, make sure that we're the the, the the ceiling as was another question wasn't jeopardized during the production. But let's remember something else. Let me let me go back to this case study. That may help to answer your question in a different way. This one. So in here, it seems that we have a cap rock. For instance, imagine we are injecting in Leduc formation, which is the case happening right now. Now, we have one cap rock in here called Ireton. We have another cap rock in here called Calmer. Both are shales, tight shales. If we go up here in the stratigraphy, all these formations, this high thickness that you see in here, this Lee Park and Upper Corrado, are basically tight shales, they can act as cap rocks. 
Um, so it seems that there are different layers of stratigraphy that can help us. It's not just the primary cap rock. The main concerns that I have for the older fields is basically because they, 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 there has been a lot of drilling in those fields. There are so many wells. We don't know how their um, integrity has been compromised. We don't know even sometimes about the condition of the cementing, the condition of casing. So those seem to be uh, probably uh, the developers and the well integrity is probably the most um, concerning part of um, caprock integrity assessment for the older uh, depleting or depleted fields. That's why I say it. I'm less concerned about the caprock integrity or initiation of fracture. And another factor that may be important is if you have a fault and that needs, that needs geophys geophysical studies uh, to make sure that we don't, a fault that has been somehow compromised and it goes all the way to the surface. In view size and city, something else, uh, but that's, that's in general uh, for all different cases, not for the old ones only. All right, uh, next question asks, what is the best way to characterize the integrity of heterogeneous versus homogeneous cap rocks? Probably. First of all, I go with characterization. Do the right characterization. As much as sample, as much as um, logs, as much as um, different different parameters that you can find. And then when you collect everything, I suggest going through integrated characterization. And by integrated characterization, I that that's probably subject of another talk. But there are so many different data sources that we can use for characterizing geo, geomechanical properties, drilling, uh, seismic, micro seismic, uh, even fracking data if you have any completion data, uh, even production data. So an idea is bringing it all together, doing the best characterization that you can. That's why I call it integrated characterization. The next step is. If you want to model heterogeneity, probably the best 3D model you can find is through your seismic. So use your seismic uh, to come with a representative model. Of course, seismic is just a part of that integrated workflow, characterization workflow. There are so many other sources. The seismic needs to be calibrated. We shouldn't rely only on seismic. Doing, after we're done with that, maybe the next step is doing probabilistic analysis and geostatistical analysis to account for the uncertainty uh, that we have in the heterogeneity of the cap rock, or even the reservoir. Uh, I would say just bring, doing the, the, all these steps together, making sure that we collect the best data, do the right integration, use the seismic volume to populate our data in 3D, and then in the next step, using probabilistic analysis, sensitivity analysis, or a geostatistical analysis to do a uh, good characterization of uncertainty. All right, uh, we got a few different versions of this next question, so I'll, I'll try to paraphrase here. Uh, globally, do you have a sense of what percent of reservoirs have failed and released some of their contents? I do not. I, I haven't done that kind of a statistical uh, survey to see, but there are some cases. We know even that in some cases we have hydrocarbon flow through uh, naturally, not even as effect of depletion. So that's something that been, uh, it's possible, it's likely to happen. We should consider it an analysis. But um, if, if, if you look here and there, it's, 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 it's not like so common. So the thing is, if, if you see as a result of production, something changes, induced seismicity happens, for instance, fault reactivation happens, or if you see a leakage of hydrocarbon, usually it comes into the news. Is that right? So it's, it's not a common, a common thing that happens, but definitely something to consider. All right, next question here is, how do you monitor pressure and temperature changes to update these models? And are there sensors installed? Are you using wireline logs or other methods? Um, 
there, I, there was a slide that, considering the time, uh, I, I removed this from this set of slides. But the idea is, and I, I really thank you for that question, is the idea is we should remember, Jim, this CAPROC integrity assessment modeling is not a one-time thing. It's a dynamic process which has to go through the life of the field and also even after seizing the operation. So as soon as new data become available, pressure data, production data, injection data, and also temperature changes, pressure changes, all the things, uh, as soon as they become available, a stress changes, for instance. We, if, we, if we can do any measurement of a stress in these fields, we need to feed it back to the model and make sure that our model is calibrated with this new data and new conditions of the field. To answer your question, wireline log seems to be something that's being used. These days, people are using about sensors, for instance, in, um, in, in, in the case of uh, uh, heavy oil production, which they are dealing with a different type of uh, thermal problem. In this case, is high temperature steam injection. Uh, they're using sensors at the same time they're using fiber optics. So they're bringing it all together to make sure that they have a nice characterization. All right, and uh, we have time to get to a few more here. I'm sorry if we're not able to get to everyone's questions, but again, you do have our contact info. so. Uh, we will make that available afterwards, but uh, the last few, we'll just see how many we can get to here. Uh, is there a potential for local micro faults resulting from the brittleness of the cap rocks uh, due to cold temperature of injected CO2 and the accompanying high pressure? Oh, there is. Yeah. So if you have a fracture network in any way, it's, it's a chance that uh, they can open up and act as a uh, leakage path. Also, even if you don't have fractures there, you may initiate new fractures there as a result of low temperature. That's at least what analysis is telling us. It's a complex problem, and that's what I'm saying that it's uh, mostly at the kind of R&D level right now, and people are working trying to characterize it. The answer is then yes. All right, uh, next question is, would the workflow for seal integrity assessment be different in the case of a saline aquifer compared to a hydrocarbon reservoir? I guess it goes back to the initial question that we had before. Um, yes, it will be different. And the reason for difference is we need to do different analysis. So if you have a depleted reservoir, you need to characterize and do the modeling to find out what happened to it during depletion. So what happened to it, basically, uh, as stresses may have changed. We know that pore pressure and temperature, pore pressure most likely has changed. The stresses may have changed. And those stress changes may have led to some kind of uh, failure in the reservoir, in the cap rock, fault reactivation. We need to make sure to characterize that before going to the case of injection. If you're casing, and, and then we come to the, to the case of injection, that's the story that I already told you. If you are talking about depleting reservoirs and using CO2 for EOR purposes, that's gonna be also a different procedure. Basically, uh, you, there, is, there is something called loading and unloading. That's a simple example to show you how we should treat those kind of problems. Let me go back to that slide on constitutive model. This one. Uh, so in here, what you're saying is two different lines, loading and unloading. And as you see in here, the behavior of rock is completely different in these two cases. So basically, during loading, which Loading is a kind of um, similar to production, and unloading is similar to injection. So during loading, you have usually plastic deformation. In, much, in some cases, you have more deformation even. During unloading, in many cases, or injection, in many cases, your deformations are smaller. They are um, elastic, not plastic. So this difference is telling us we need two completely different models 
so bottling, injection, and production. One other thing that can happen during cycles of injection and production is cyclic hysteresis. So when you have uh, several cycles of injection and production, your rock properties are going to change. We call this hysteresis. So in that case, yes, we need to, we need to consider all these effects into account and do our modeling based on that. Okay, uh, then we'll get to two more questions here. Uh, is there any any practical cutoff for porosity or permeability that you use for target selection? I didn't choose the targets, so I'm not the best person to answer. I did the cap rock analysis mostly. I'm a geomechanics person. Um, I can refer you. I'll probably you can contact me directly. I can I can send you a very very good paper uh, on on a group of people in Master Research Center here who use the cr different criteria to choose and select those uh, most uh, 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 m most most effective uh, the best basically formations. Uh, and what in this case was aquifers. And and I guess they did some studies on the depleted reservoirs as well for CO2 sequestration. But definitely we need to have high uh, porosity high for, for, the, for the sake of capacity, high permeability for the sake of injectivity. I don't want to give you a wrong number in here as a cost. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, and then the last question here is, how will horizontal wells affect temperature uh, effects? Won't they help? Uh, that's a very good question. So the analysis that I did in here, in that case, this is the was for verticals. Well, and as you see in here, the changes in the stresses and change, changes in temperature are very local, happen close to the well. Um, now, yeah, so they're happening very close to the well. Now imagine that you have a horizontal well. The first thing that happens in the case of horizontal well, you have a higher, a, a kind of larger area of uh, the reservoir being exposed to this low temperature. So most likely we're gonna have a different plume in here, which considering the changes to aspect ratio, that may be an effective parameter, but remember that uh, if, if, if that temperature change goes all the way to the cap rock, uh, a more extensive area of the cap rock will be exposed to temperature change, and those problems that I mentioned are happening. Uh, now, the next question is, can I locate that well down in the reservoir so the temperature transfer will be limited to the cap rock? Yes, that may help you. All right, um, so those are all the questions that we're gonna have time for today. Thank you, everybody, uh, for the excellent questions. And Merdad, thank you for the Q&A and for a really, really interesting presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking your time. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, thanks again. Um, I will send out the recording uh, along with some resources here for you. And again, if we didn't get to your questions or uh, you have uh, other questions for us, please don't hesitate to respond. Uh, so thanks everybody for your time. Uh, take care and everyone stay safe. Have a good day or night. Thank you so much, Clay. All right, thank you. Yeah, bye.